I, my father's father's job title was computer, and my dad was a programmer, as were a number of his brothers. And so I, I had a computer in my house from very early on. I started programming at about five and was pretty sure I wanted to make computers uh, my career uh, pretty early on. Uh, so I, I, I started programming on this or that, and uh, while I was at high, in high school, I worked for the Harvard Physics Labs doing uh, antimatter simulation and MIT Lincoln Labs uh, trying to tell the difference between mine collapses and nuclear bomb explosions. Uh, and then I went to uh, Stanford and immediately declared a major in computer science because I was pretty sure that that's what I wanted to do. Um, I had some just fantastic late nights in the lab. Um, there, there was this one lab at Stanford in particular that had all the really high-powered graphics machines, and, and those were SGIs back in the day. And uh, it, was, it was a really intense environment. I, was, um, I think I'm, I was the first freshman to ever take this graduate level course in computer graphics. And I was sitting there in the basement. I'd literally put on swimming goggles because they'd help me focus and concentrate on the screen in front of me and not have me be distracted by what was going on there. So you can imagine the sight of, of this, at the time, scrawny uh, little, little, little freshman like with, with swimming goggles on in this uh, basement of, <laughs> at Stanford like working on SGIs. And it was, it was a really remarkable experience, and it ended up leading me to, uh, that summer, have an internship directly with uh, Mark Lavoie, um, who's, who's just this incredibly well-esteemed graphics professor at Stanford. How many of you have seen the um, Change the Focus camera that came out, like, in the last month or two? Yeah. A really remarkable camera that came out of the Stanford Graphics Lab. It's now been commercialized, where you can take a picture of a scene like this, and after the fact, change what was being focused on in the picture. Because this camera is not merely capturing um, the uh, plane of light that's impingent, like, like classic analog cameras and, and pretty much all modern digital cameras. It's actually capturing the full light field. So exactly how is light impingent upon the sensors versus just how much is, is, is coming into a given pixel, right? R really remarkable stuff that changes the way that you think about cameras. Well, that came from the Stanford Graphics Lab. So some very, very smart people. And I have to say, that was actually the worst summer of my life. In fact, it was so bad, it was so horrifically lonely, me and a um, SGI reality engine, which is about the size of a small room and is need to be, needed to be kept very cold. It was cold and noisy, and it was just me there, the summer after my freshman year, all day long, trying to rewrite code um, to make it about 10 times faster so that instead of having to ship their data from Italy where they were taking three-dimensional laser scans of all of Michelangelo statues back to the lab at Stanford, there wasn't actually a fast enough uh, data link to be able to do that in reasonable time. But instead, they could bring one of these smaller machines along with them to Italy and have it stitch together the watertight models uh, to produce sub-millimeter level resolution of, you know, the David. Yeah, like me. But um, so, so I was sitting there in the, in, the, in the lab, spending these late days trying to optimize this code. And it was just miserable. Literally, the first girl I had a meaningful conversation with after that, I dated for four and a half years. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it took a couple years for me to figure out that I, I was actually a social creature and that it made me happy to be around other people. And that the classic narrative that we get told about how engineers are antisocial, right? And it's, it's a critical part of engineering culture that you not really connect on an emotional basis with other people. It's actually a lie. I don't even know who makes up this stuff. You know, like there are these, these tremendously harmful jokes like, you know, how do you tell that an engineer you're talking with is extrovert while well, they're staring at your shoes? Right? Like, it, <laughs> this sort of stuff pervades engineering culture. And it, it took me a really long time to realize something that was true about myself and had been true about myself since childhood, which was that I actually liked people and I liked being around people. And it was a very important part of my existence. It was actually a housewarming party at a, at a big house that I had rented out with some friends in Hillsborough. And we were putting together the guest list for our, our housewarming party. And my, my, my friends who were living there with me, they, they were not geeky like me, they were real cool, they were real connected, and they each put together about 25 people that they really wanted to come uh, hang out at this housewarming party. 
And I went through all the people who I wanted to make sure could come to this party, and it was about 120 people. I said, oh no, I totally screwed this up, I'm sorry. Um, you know, we were only supposed to pick 20 people. They're like, no, 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 no. You know, invite as many people as who you'd like to have at the party. I said, well, I want these 120 people to be at the party. And, and I was like, you should make sure to invite all the people you want to have at the party. They were like, we have. Yeah, I had this just weird moment of <laughs> self-reflection. Well, wait, these cool people who know lots of people want 20 people at their housewarming party, and me, the introverted nerd, wants 120 people. Maybe I'm not an introverted nerd. Like, ah, what does that mean? What does it mean for an engineer to be connected socially, to, to, to find that really important? And so I had to sort of like step back and like reevaluate my life. Like, what, is, what does it mean to be a social engineer? And it turns out that a lot of other people have to go through the same things, where they don't want to be locked in a closet. I once got asked at a job fair, like the most horrible question you could ever be asked at a job fair, which was, a, are you the type who just loves to be locked in the room and all we need to do is shove pizza under the door? This was from a pr prospective future employer. Right? <laughs> I was like, what's the right answer to this question? Like, <laughs> But there's just this notion that, that, that's, that, that that's what an excellent engineer is. They're, 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 they're introverted, they're shy, they just give them enough Mountain Dew, uh, give them enough pizza. I don't know what the fuck it is with pizza. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like my filet mignon. Like, I've got, I've got a it's tongue, right? I have a palate. You know? <laughs> uh, there's this notion, you just throw pizza and Mountain Dew and they'll be happy. Like, no, it's, it's not universally true. But... <laughs> But there, there, were, there, were, there, there, was, there was this notion that, it, that, that, that it's supposed to be introverted, and it's not. And it's actually communal. And really, if you, if you take a step back and you go to the roots of what's, what started Silicon Valley, what were like the, some of the real ignition points, right? You get, for instance, the Homebrew Computer Club. How many of you guys know about the Homebrew Computer Club? Yeah, yeah. See, like, I'm young. I wasn't around then, but I got respect for the Homebrew Computer Club. So these guys, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, were a bunch of folks who, particularly around when the Altair came out, which is like the first hobbyist computer, decided to get together once every two weeks to talk about, hey, what the heck can you do with this thing, right? The idea is that it, every two week period, they had discovered something new they could go and do with this hobbyist computer. Because it's the first time like regular people had had access to computers, right? And, and, and then the results were pretty remarkable. And in, you know, Microsoft arguably got like a very solid launch out of that. There's a famous letter uh, that Bill Gates wrote to the members of the Homebrew Computer Club to telling them to stop pirating BASIC uh, because he needed to make some money off of this darn thing. Um, and, and, and Apple Computer arguably like really uh, got going at the Homebrew Computer Club. So it was the spirit of getting together and talking about, hey, uh, what if, what, what's possible? Let's just brainstorm, you know, for, 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 forget putting restrictions about this, getting, getting uh, NDAs signed, IP agreements signed. Let's just think about the future. Let's think about, like, what could we build with this, right? And that was remarkable and powerful and transformative. And out of that came the West Coast Computer Fair, which ended up evolving into CES, right? I mean, how many of you have heard of CES? Okay, there we go. <laughs> like, those things really ended up scaling and becoming powerful, world-changing forces. So fast forward to, to, to um, I want to say, like mid-2000s. Um, I, I was throwing these real big, fun parties at this house in, in Hillsborough, and they ended up getting uh, sh shut down because they got a little bit too big and crazy. And I actually got to know the uh, chief of police rather well in Hillsborough. Um, I still have a shirt she gave me. Um, but... <laughs> um, uh, we, we were trying to figure out what to do next, and I had people come over for movie nights, and this one friend of mine, Jeff Lindsay, suggested that we do this, this really interesting thing, that we have uh, a LAN party, which is where people would bring over their, their, their computers and play video games against each other over the local area network, hence LAN party, but instead of actually playing video games and shooting at each other, what if we could write code? So it'd be like a coding LAN party. And since it was going to be at Super Happy Fun House, we could call it Super Happy Dev House. Super Happy Fun House was the name for this big party house that we had in, in, in Hillsborough. And so um, that first night, we had about 12 people together in my living room, like a much smaller group than even this group here today. 
and uh, we just, we were writing code. We were drinking beer, we were drinking Red Bulls, you know, we were like sharing ideas, we were brainstorming on things. And around one in the morning, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm, there's this idea that's been sort of bubbling in the back of my head for a couple months to make it easy for people to set up their own private wikis, hosted, so you don't need to know Linux, you don't need to be a system administrator, you don't have to have your own hardware. You just type in what you want uh, the name of your group to be, you type in your email address, and bam, you've got your own private space that you can share with people real easily. In fact, as easily as making a peanut butter sandwich. So I'm going to call it PBWiki. So one in the morning, I registered the domain pbwiki.com, and I've got something basically working by about 8 in the morning. I email a bunch of friends, I pass out, um, I go... Uh, <laughs> hiking with my friend the next day, and then Monday morning I bother to actually go and check my email. I'm like, oh, about a thousand groups have signed up for this thing. It's like, wow, all right, I need to pay attention to this, right? And ended up growing that, um, you know, over time into, into my day job, which employs 22 people. We host collaborative workspaces for about a million and a half groups worldwide. Um, but the, the conclusion from that first event was, wow, this was a success. We should do this again. So once every six weeks, we throw another uh, dev house. And you know, after about nine dev houses, and there being more than 200 people programming all day long in my house, my roommates asked me to start rotating where <laughs> dev house was happening. Uh, and, and just to, to, to say nothing of what it was doing to our power bill or uh, even the limitations it put on our, our internet usage to have 150 people who all really wanted to use and abuse the internet on a, on a dinky connection. Um, we started growing it up. We started uh, rotating it to, to, to different locations. And then by, by the time it got to about the 30th one of these, uh, which was at the uh, beginning of 2009, uh, we were in Sun's Executive Briefing Center, or, which is now actually uh, fa the Facebook buildings uh, in, in Palo Alto, right, right by the Dumbarton. And um, we took over the place. I and mean, this is more people than the EBC uh, had, will have now, I can fairly authoritatively say, ever had in that building, because that building is no longer Sun's Executive Briefing Center. And it was amazing just to see 500 computer programmers with laptops open, strewn every which what corner. You walk down halls and there'd be like people there, like in the hallway, laptop open, coding on things, sharing ideas. We had people reprogramming Roombas. We had people working on programmable knitting machines. Um, there was just all kinds of energy there. Like people were clearly passionate about building and passionate about creating the future. And so I got up in front of this group of people and I said, you know, one of, one of the, my least favorite parts about DevHouse is kicking you all out at the end. So what if I didn't have to do that? What if we had a place where I didn't have to tell you all to go home and stop hacking and stop this remarkable, brilliant energy that defines Silicon Valley? And we should call it a hacker dojo, right? A place where you can go and spend time and refine your craft and then really rise to excellence in your field. So I got together about 12 people uh, who would come to my offices at PBWiki uh, once a week to go and sync up and say, okay, well, you know, how are we going to form this organization? Do we want to be for-profit? Do we want to be non-profit? What are the different sites that are possibilities? How do we recruit members? And after about six months, we had a not-for-profit corporation formed, and we had leased uh, about 5,000 square feet of space down in Mountain View. And it took off immediately. So it says, here we are uh, about, uh, almost exactly actually, two years after we opened the Hacker Dojo down in Mountain View. We're one of the largest hacker spaces in the world. We have about 300 members. Uh, we have about 8,500 square feet, and we're looking at uh, basically doubling that within the next few months, uh, either by opening a facility up in San Francisco, or we're looking at doubling our campus uh, down, in, down in Mountain View. This place is open 24-7. Once you've been a member there, membership is 100 bucks a month. Once you've been a member for 30 days, you get an RFID badge that you can badge yourself into the building any time, day or night. Right. We, uh, you can attend any of the classes, lectures, workshops, uh, hackathons there yourself. You can host your own there for free. We, we, we don't charge you to go and bring together your own gatherings. Some people start companies there. Some people start nonprofits there. Uh, some people just work from home but don't like working actually 
from home, um, th this is a great place for it because they're around that kind of creative energy. You know, people need to respect that that creative energy exists within engineering. The same as in writing, the same as in painting. When you go to a like painter's you... retreat, people don't ask you, are you all working on the same painting? So it still sort of surprises me that, that people ask, like, when you got a couple hundred people coming to a hacker dojo, like, are you guys all working on the same project? How do you get those people? How do you convince them to go and all code the same thing? And it's like... <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know people, people show up and they work on whatever the heck they want to work on. If they want to form groups and, and turn that into something interesting, they're welcome to. And if they want to just go and work on their own fun projects and learn a programming language, they're absolutely welcome to. So it's, it's kind of an anarchic, freeform community. And I think in that place, uh, in that sense, it, it reflects on society's need for uh, a place to, to, to catalyze new social interactions, right? And this is what was being referred to by the third place, right? So there's, there's home, and that's pretty well defined, right? These days it's a semi-nuclear family, right? And, and, and you generally don't tend to share that with lots of other people unless your home's listed on Airbnb. And then you've got, you know, work. And the traditional office place is, you know, your employer owns and leases and it has this sort of exclusive rights over a certain uh, amount of real estate, right? Um, so it's just your coworkers that you're interacting with, and some people feel uncomfortable with having like deep personal interactions with their coworkers because it's you know can, can make things awkward if you need to fire them. I, I've, I've fired two people and then done their weddings uh, the two months afterwards. It's actually happened, happened twice now. Um, so it's like. <laughs> I, I think people worry too much about that, so they feel like they, they, they need to put up this social barrier between themselves and their coworkers. And th that means that there's not really some place where they can be legitimately socially interacting with their peers on a regular basis. And that people need that place where they can be energized, where they can go to, to get new ideas, to hear about what other people are working on, not just at a conference, not just at a, a, a talk like this, but to really have uh, this, this regular community of their peers that they can tap into, they can brainstorm with, and they can maybe turn into business partners, but that's not a requisite part of it. It's a community for them to, to be a part of, a community of innovators, a community of people who just love to create because that's what's in their blood. It's who they are, and you can't keep them from, from innovating, right? So the, that's what the, the dojo is an example of, and what, what's fascinating is to look internationally at the rise of the hackerspace movement. Right, so how many of you guys know about like the hackerspace movement? A couple people, cool, cool, cool. It actually it started in, in, in Germany with the Chaos Computer Club, which is like the oldest hacker group in existence. And they started putting together these places where, where hackers, and just to be really perfectly clear, I don't mean uh, evil people who write viruses and break into things and destroy computer systems and read your email. Um, uh, I, I mean people who just love building new things and, and are, get really in the zone about building surprising awesome new things. And so it's, that, that's sort of like the original meaning of the word hackers before movies with Angelina Jolie came out into, <laughs> into the marketplace. right? Um, and it started with the Chaos Computer Club putting together uh, a space in even the late 80s. And by the late 90s, there were like three, four, maybe five hacker spaces worldwide. It was kind of like a, an interesting, kind of obscure concept. And in the intervening 10 years between 2000 and 2010, we've gone from about four or five hacker spaces worldwide now to several hundred hacker spaces worldwide. And the last time I actually created a graph showing like the spread of hacker spaces over time, I had to plot it on a log plot. Like it's just, it was, it was unreadable on a, on a linear plot. So any of you can go to hackerspaces.org and take a look at the global map of where are hacker spaces internationally. And I think that speaks to like this deep international need to, for, 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 for computer programmers to be around each other, to be encouraging each other, to be teaching each other, and to be in, in, a, in a community of peers. So how many of you have, have, have a third place that, that, that you go to? Just call out, what is the third place that you go to? Call it out. A pottery studio. A pottery studio. Awesome. Tech shop. Tech shop. Tech shop's amazing. Huge props for tech shop. Peace. Peace. <laughs> cool. 
It's, I, I would go to Hacker Dojo, but it's an hour and a half away from my house. So. No, we'll work on opening more. <laughs> uh, other third places that people go to? Beach. No. Beach. The beach. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Like people, people need places to you know, uh, unwind and, and, and meditate. But um, I, I really see this, this taking off on a global basis. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asked to advise a number of projects that are starting up at universities, that are starting up internationally. I, I was just down in Cabo three weeks ago. They're trying to start an innovation space down there for Mexican hackers. Uh, North Carolina State is opening up an uh, innovation center. Uh, Penn State University is, is opening up uh, InnoBlue. Um, just everywhere there are these new innovation spaces forming. Um, I think the right way to form them is really to take a nascent community, a bunch of people who already like gathering together and, and dig each other's energy, something like you know, SVII, where you guys have this regular kind of uh, meetup, right, where you're sharing energy with each other. Um, and, and then at some point it just gets to be so much that, that you, you, you want to incarnate it, right? You want to make it, make it physical with your own space so you don't have to sit on a golf course, uh, even if it is a lovely golf course, right? Um, that, that, that can house that. And like, this is, in, in some ways, if you really want to step back and take a look at the broader story arc, like, this is, this is <laughs> as maybe I'm treading on dangerous territory, this is, this is what happened to, to religion, right? Like, it, the, or, the early church, you know, met in, in people's houses, right? And this is actually true of almost any different kind of church and religion you could look at. Like, mm -hmm. these started as informal gatherings that were happening in people's houses, and then they started borrowing space in somebody else's establishment, and then eventually they start building edifices, right? And that's what we're starting to see with the, with the hackerspace movement. Now, I'm not trying to claim that there's some, like, some, some uh, religious component to it, but it's just, like, it's how social movements... Uh, are, are incarnated. And we're at a speed now of global communication where these things can become global affairs in almost no time at all. I mean, as witnessed by the fact that it was a German group that started off the, the, the hackerspace movement. So anyhow, um, you guys are all welcome to come down to Mountain View anytime. Just walk in the front door to the Hacker Dojo, say, hi, I heard about this place. Can someone give me a tour? And we'd be happy to show you around and to show you what we have there and to like, introduce you to the community that we, that, that, that we have there because we are here to support builders and innovators and hackers everywhere. So thank you for that. <laughs>